different messages truly do resonate with different people. Good transformational teaching and writing can't just be conceptual. It also has to be deeply emotional. It has to have been written from an emotional place. Something in the messaging of that book resonated with that person, which led to that type of opportunity. You're selling 50 books at a clip. You know what I mean? That's brilliant, brilliant marketing. That's you know, sold so like, that sold like 20,000 copies right there. No kidding. Just that. Just that. Unbelievable. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the show. Today's guest, Dr. Benjamin Hardy, is an organizational psychologist and is one of the world's leading experts on the psychology of entrepreneurial leadership and exponential growth. He's also the author of multiple books, which I think I've read all of, including Willpower Doesn't Work, Personality is Impermanent, Be Your Future Self Now, Who Not How, The Gap and the Gain, 10X is Easier Than 2X, which is his most recent book, and there are more. Benjamin, good to have you, man. Yes. Good to be with you. <laughs> What's up, Jamie? I, I appreciate it. So I wanted to start this interview thinking about like, where do I start? Because you, you've got so much content out there and we're going to dive into the principles of the book and everything. But I don't know if you, you won't remember this. We were just talking about meeting each other uh, in Cincinnati and you asked me this question, very simple question. What do you want? What do you want to do? And I came up with like the most convoluted, I, I, typical of my brain answer, just all over the place. I want this, but then maybe this, da, 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 da. and you were literally, uh, you, you had, we had those, um, those reds, uh, like helmets with ice cream in it. <laughs> so you're literally like just patiently listening and scooping this ice cream. And I go, yeah, well, what do you want? And you said, I just want to write books. And that I I've told that story to more people than you could ever know, because it was like, oh yeah. That's pretty easy. But where did that clarity, like when did that become your thing? Like when, how did you get that level of clarity is where I wanted to start. Like, do you remember the moment when I just want to write books became your thing? So I really believe that clarity is a skill and simplicity is a skill. Like even, mm -hmm. even I have, and I will tell you about the books thing, but I, I, I spend even in the book, 10X is easier than 2X. Like so much of it is just to simplify your thinking, to truly weed out the noise, right? To weed the garden of your mind. And so, and, and I really believe that simplifying is like a crucial step before you, you know, grow a massive garden, like simplify all the weeds out first. Um, so um, that's that in terms of, well, so I was going to say about my, my accountability partner, and I've had the same accountability partner for a decade. He was one of my professors. He ended up leaving academia. And now he's like a very successful entrepreneur and stuff. And we've just been great friends for a decade. And we regularly will have calls, share our goals. And every time we have these conversations, he shares with me his goals. And they're always too many and way too complex. And then he'll ask me, what do I want to do? And it's like, it's never going to be more than two things. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. even, like even if it's like, what do I want to do in the next six months or for the rest of 2023? I, I, it's going to be two things, man. Like, you know, like I, there's not gonna be a lot. And so that's, I think that's something that must be trained and worked on um, and thoughtful about. Um, I love the quote from the book, The One Thing, which is, you know, Gary Keller's book. And he just says, do few things for a large effect rather than doing many things with side effects. And I just think that that's crucial. You know, side effects being health problems, relationship problems, stress problems. In terms of books, it's 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 in it's been a process. So when I served a two year church mission, um, that that changed my life. I did a lot of journaling, fell in love with learning, writing, and reading, and I read a lot of books. And so it was during that time that I decided I wanted to be an author, but I just didn't know what it would take. And so, you know, that I've been home from that experience now for thirteen years. And so, yeah, I mean, I think over time I've just stripped away more and more of frivolous pursuits. You know, like yeah. I, I do have other goals outside of writing but for the most part like i know i'm going to be writing for the rest of my life like i know that that's something i want to keep doing more and more of and so there's there's a few other things that are super important that i want to do but in terms of like my career not much outside of just writing better books i love that can you i love the statement you said clarity is a skill for some reason simplicity is a skill makes sense to me so does clarity it doesn't not make sense but can you deep dive that a little bit more what do you mean when you say clarity is a skill i think clarity and simplicity are almost synonyms uh, if something is not if something is not simple it's probably not clear um that's why I, I think that 
Steve Jobs said, work really hard to get your thinking simple because once you get it simple, which can be difficult, then you can move mountains. And so I think clarity and simplicity work hand in hand. And in terms of clarity, clarity, clarity and simplicity are similar, but they are different. So I think clarity is like taking the time to actually think through what matters. What do I want? You know, that, that first question you said, but then truly simplifying it down. Like, is this what I really want? What are the weeds? Like, how much of this stuff really matters? You know, how much of it doesn't matter? Like, let's break it all down. Um, and so I think that both of them are, ma- are master skills and that being able to clarify something and also simplify it are, what, are, are helpful at moving you forward. And if you, don't, if you don't have clarity, you probably don't have simplicity. And if you don't have simplicity, you probably don't have clarity. I heard uh, somebody say that uh, like 50% of the U.S. population reads in an eighth grade level or lower. Uh, so the point on that, this is sort of, sort of a marketing point, is whatever your message is, and that you're not marketing your message of, I just want to write books, but it is an internal message, marketing internally almost, or even just so people are clear on what you want and how they can help you. But it is sort of in that vein, right? Simplicity is the idea that, hey, even an eighth grader can understand that, right? It's not a complex I- idea that you just want to write books, you know? But what blocks people, do you think? I know what blocks me. I'm curious what, you're, what you've seen. What blocks people from allowing themselves to be that simple, to be that clear? Um, they have a lot of conflicting voices inside and outside of their heads, and they're very conflicted on what they actually want. They're not actually sure. They're not fully honest with themselves or others um, for a multitude of reasons. Self-trust could be trauma, could be security, wanting to pay the bills. Like there's a million reasons why it's very difficult to be simple, to be clear. Um, I, I think that like one thing I think about, and this is true of high achievers as well as anyone else. And I, I know who I'm talking to, so I might as well just stay on the high achievers end. There are people I know and even work with who are very successful, like in the range of nine to 10 figure, you know, hundred millionaire, billionaire, et cetera. And even at that level, so much 50 million different directions. Um, And as a result, a lot of stress and a lot of them still not making the true progress that they truly wanted. Like, yes, they're doing great things. Yes, they have a great life. But there's still a a few things or maybe one thing that they've really been wanting to do. And they're not really making the progress on that thing because they're still going a thousand different directions on all the other things. And you know, I think I've shared this with you before, but I love the quote, we are kept from our goal, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to a lesser goal. And, and so, yeah, I think it takes a lot of self-honesty and uh, practice to just strip things away and say, this is the game I want to play. This is what I care about. This is me. This is my future self. And I don't, it doesn't need to be impressive to anyone else. Can you unpack that quote a little bit? I want to be really, really clear on that because I, I feel like it landed, but I'm also questioning whether or not it did. So could you unpack that quote just a little bit? Yeah, so I'll say it again, and then I actually want to unpack it with you. So yeah. we are kept from our goal, not by obstacles. So we're kept from our goal, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to a lesser goal. So we are not stopped in the achieving of our goal by any forms of obstacles between us and the goal. It's because we take a clear path to a lesser goal. And that lesser goal could be anything and everything that's not what we ultimately want. It could be anything. Like it could be that lesser goal could be billions of dollars. It could be sitting on Facebook. It could be whatever it is. The lesser goal is something that we seek um, in a lot of ways to avoid (laughs) what we truly want. So give an example with say writing a book. So the goal that might we might have I, it was to what be a New York Times bestseller? Is, is well, the goal might story? honestly well, I'll, I'll break it down in simple terms. In this case, the goal might just be to write the book, but the lesser goal might be do that Zoom call or to do or even just a lesser goal might pop up to distract yourself because you know we we end up wanting to do that all the time. And so the lesser <laughs> goal could be anything and everything we do. You know, Stephen Pressfield calls it resistance, right? that you'll do anything and everything you can. And so those are all lesser goals, anything that the mind conjures up or situations conjure up. So yeah, it could, you know, it could be that simple that in every situation you can either go for the goal or opt for a lesser goal. 
real quick, you talked about millionaires, billionaires, multimillionaires, nine figure people all still have multiple distractions. And you even said, uh, or are pursuing too many different things. And you had mentioned maybe not always, you, but many, many, often. I mean, dealing yeah. with that regularly. Yes. I see the same. I see the same. And, and I'm guilty of it as well. Um, you mentioned, it sounds like maybe, maybe just sort of innately in some way you've understood and you apply this idea that it's not going to be more than two things. In speaking in in those terms, are you are you specifically saying from a a, a from a, a business perspective or a relationship perspective, or does it cross? In other words, when you say somebody people are focused on too many things, are you saying within the context of one sort of pursuit, like in my business or in my wealth, or is it I only have two things I'm focused on? Period. It's my books and my family. So two things is not actually like the fact. Like it doesn't have to be two. I'm just I was giving that as an example. No, no, no. I. Right. With my, I'm wondering the same thing though. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I actually like human beings have multiple dimensions. So like, obviously, you know, me as an example, I've got my, my personal life. I've got my health, my relationships. I'm a husband, a father. I have friendships. I have a relationship with God. So like there's, you know, I've got the things that are like relationships and, and very personal, right? Even my relationship. And so I get that people are multidimensional beings. I think in this case, and I'll, and I'll give you one model that I use that's super helpful, but I like, and I've shared this before, I love the quote from Jim Collins where he said, if you have more than three priorities, you have zero. And so for me, I really do try to keep my life that simple where it's like, okay, I've got, you know, I've got my personal life. I've got, maybe my books and maybe my finances, like, you know, like, and those two are honestly like hand in hand. And so, um, maybe I add something in there. Like if I choose to social service or something like that. Um, one thing that's really helped me is the concept. And I wrote about it in personality is isn't permanent called Keystone goal. I don't know if you mm. remember that concept. I do. Yeah. That one has always helped me. Because what that concept does, and, and for anyone who doesn't know what a keystone is, the keystone is uh, like it's a center rock in an arch. And if you pull the keystone out, the arch collapses. Um, and so it's like it's the thing that holds everything else together. And it actually fits very well with that whole idea of what's the one thing that if accomplished, knocks, you know, like essentially solves everything else as a simplifying process. And so the thing, like one thing that's truly helped me is figuring out what's the one target or outcome that will ultimately help me achieve and become everything else I'm trying to do. So like as one simple example, and I've shared, I think I've shared this somewhere. Um, like uh, obviously at one point, a keystone goal of mine was to get into a PhD program, right? Like, like that was the keystone goal. That was like the center focus, but that goal wasn't purely career based. Like, yes, that was a career goal, but it was also like it influenced me and my wife. Like once I got into a PhD program, we would get out of her parents' basement and we'd go off and be able to live in some other state. And so like getting into a PhD program wasn't just about my career. It was about my life. It was about the lifestyle me and my wife were going to have at that next stage, being graduate students, living in our own house, being across the country, being on our own. So like getting into that PhD program would get me and my wife, we didn't have kids at that time to our next stage. And so that was a keystone goal because it, it helped me get to my next stage as my future self in the key areas that I wanted. Um, when I was in my PhD program, the keystone goal was to get a six figure book contract with one of the major publishers. And like that one goal, if accomplished would help me in all the key ways, call it my three priorities. Like I felt like it would help me be able to provide well for my wife and kids at that point. Now I've got three foster kids. It would also help me develop the skills and you know abilities I wanted as a writer. It also you know be able to provide for them, have the freedom I wanted to have a flexible schedule to be with my family. Um, it would develop you know develop my skills, abilities, even my faith. And so that one goal actually shaped a process such that I could be who I wanted to be, and it will ultimately knock down all the. It was like the one domino that would knock down the the multiple that I you know that would help me be who I want to be. And so I, I've really applied that idea. And, you know, even have a keystone goal now that is not career related, but is going to trans it, but it filters my career choices such that, um, 
you know, it's ultimately going to make my career a lot more successful. The phrase that's coming up as we talk or the, the words, uh, especially when we talk about, you know, just want to write books or the keystone goals that you had are purpose and mission, purpose and mission. Can you delineate those in any way that you, you, you want to, what is purpose? What is mission? Um, and how do you define, well, where, what is, I just want to write books. Is that mission? Is it something else? Is it purpose for you? Can you just sort of talk through purpose, mission? Maybe you haven't even yet articulated purpose, at least for us in this conversation and just sort of walk through wh where those two variables come in and where the, I just want to write books part comes in. I, I don't really think this may sound weird. I don't think too much about the word mission. I do think the word purpose is useful and, uh, you know, some people who have thought more about those two words probably have a lot more nuance than me. I would honestly probably just cl cl cluster them together for me. And um, and I, I generally just stick with the word purpose in this case. And um, yeah, so purpose, pur purpose for me is super important. Um, I think that that's one of the things that makes uh, us in in intelligent beings is that we can define a purpose and choose a purpose. And build towards a purpose, go to the moon as an example, like very interesting, choose to have a family, choose to, you know, create things. I think that that's what makes humans super intelligent and even the offspring of God. <laughs> and so, um, that's not what makes us that, but that's an attribute. Um, but, um, so in terms of just write books and I don't want to ruin your story that you've told to many people, but like, um, that might've even just been like a, like a, a quick answer to a quick it was. question. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't as it, if you turned with a professorial look and said, no, this is my, <laughs> this is my, no, I mean, that's, there's, there's a lot of truth. There's a lot of truth to that answer, but at the same time, that answer was po probably also just reflective of the Benjamin Hardy that you were with, you know, in 2020 or whenever that was versus the Benjamin Hardy four years before that, or the Benjamin Hardy three years later. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I do think that there's something that fits with it, though, and that that's that uh, I have, def at least for now, decided that writing books is a very enjoyable part of fulfilling, at least for now, what I define as my purpose. I like that. Mission and purpose for me, I delineate. I just, just for the purposes of discussion. Yeah, go ahead. I, um, I look at purpose as sort of the reason for being. And mission being the action on that purpose. So, as an okay, example, so like a mission is like within the purpose. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah or an makes, offshoot. That makes I, total sense. Yeah, I feel like the mission mission changes, but there's always uh, there's always like a grounded purpose. And to your point, I think it's hard to define and discover purpose. I think you know, and I well, that's not your point. You do define it, but I think that is a harder thing versus you know, go to the moon is to me a mission. But there's an inherent purpose that drives that mission. Maybe it is I like, to. I, I like that a lot. Right. Maybe it is to, to do whatever. So I recently I always define my purpose as providing inspirational content to you know help people uh, change their lives, something along those lines. That was my purpose. But through deep introspection, I do this solo weekend. We talked about that on this solo weekend. I kind of came to like, actually, my purpose is to be seen, meaning to be visible, to, to express a message like my purpose is to be a communicator. That's just I wasn't born with pigment, great hair, height. Uh, small teeth. I, I don't have those attributes, right? But one thing I was born with is the ability to communicate and I enjoy it. It's purposeful for me. And podcasting for me is the mission, is is part of the mission, like to, to grow a podcast or just to have a podcast is part of the mission or to inspire other people, whatever you want to call it, is the mission grounded in or based off of the purpose of just simply being seen. Um, I don't know. That's how I always looked at it, but I don't know if you have any any thoughts further on that as we talk uh, about. Well, it. I'm just honestly like thinking about the two words, and I think about military, where it's like you know, there's a mission that these people need to accomplish. Maybe it's you know, go and uh, basically capture the bad guy. That may be the mission, but that's not the overarching purpose of what they're trying to accomplish. But that's a mission within the purpose, and so that's that's how I'm thinking about it as you're talking. That's interesting. Now it's fascinating. One thing I want to unpack as well, real quick. I'm really fascinated by the accountability partner. Can you just, what, to whatever extent you're comfortable, what does that relationship look like? It's 10 years. So do you have a structure? What is, how do you hold each other accountable? That's a, that's near and dear to my heart. And a lot of people in this community, this GoBundance community, this accountability piece. What does that look like for you? It's interesting because it's evolved a lot of our time. And I, I don't know if I, I don't know if 
it would fit the criteria for for the GoBundance level of accountability. Like I, I know that you guys, accountability is a big part of that community, and I, I don't know if, I don't know if we truly hold each other accountable at that level. I've had a hard time with accountability with random people that I don't hire for the purpose of helping me achieve a result. You know what I mean? So like, accountability is very easy for me. As an example, like. I'm, I was very accountable in writing the books with Dan. Like, I, you know, like I was very accountable in accomplishing my side of the deal. And I'm very accountable to my wife and stuff like that. Um, it's difficult for me to just like get with someone like you, like Jamie, even though like you and I are motivated people, we're seemingly great friends. It'd be very hard for me to be an accountability partner with someone like you. Just because like there's not really any real reason for me to be accountable to you. As weird mm. as that sounds. No. Oh, and that. so yeah. and so that's but I know that other people can do that. Like that's part of why you join a group like uh Go Abundance. Uh, that's not really how we've approached it. So maybe the word accountability partner is a bad word, but that's just what we called it. What we were in the beginning, because I was his graduate research assistant and I was um writing a lot of papers with him trying to get into graduate school. He was a young professor, very, very ambitious. Um, but we found that we had similar interests and we'd walk around the university together and just share our goals, talk, and we would ultimately just share our goals with each other, share what we were going to like big picture goals, but also like we'd give a detailed list. It's like, what are you going to accomplish before our next walk? And so then we would just on the next walk, like look at the list and say, what did you knock out? You know, like, like literally just account, just talk yeah. about it and say what happened. And that was what it originated as. And we met every week it was on my schedule every tuesday we would have our 30 minute call because you know obviously i ended up moving to south carolina and where i did my phd and now so, i mean i've been gone from living near him for 10 years almost but we still maintained the calls almost every week during those 10 years until recently and we'd go sporadic there'd be times where maybe a month would go by but i mean i probably talked to him within the month you know and we still talk probably once or twice a month. There's something to just having, having that call on the calendar even, isn't there? Just, just, okay. Uh, what was I going to talk about? Oh, okay. I got to bring that stuff back to the forefront. Not that he's doing anything to you, but you know, it, it's just the fact that it's on the calendar. No. Well with him. And I think that there is something really powerful about having someone you respect. So like one thing I will say is like, he's someone who I'm happy to have in my five people that I spend the most time with. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so like, there's, I'm very thoughtful about that. Like, I'm like, are these five people representative of my future self? Or are they representative of my past or present self? And if, if those five people are not truly very connected to my future self, they're probably the wrong five. So he's someone that I really love talking to. I love being connected with him. I do respect him. And there's something at this point, because we've also been so deeply immersed in each other's processes the last 10 years, there's something really sentimental about getting on the phone with him, hearing how he's doing, him sharing what he's focused on, me sharing what I'm focused on, me sharing my deep struggles. Like there's, he's one of those few people where I can just be unapologetically honest, not only about my goals, but also about my struggles. And so it's even more just on that level now. Where it's yeah. just like, we just talked for 30, 50, 30, 40 minutes, whatever. And it's super beneficial. And sometimes when I'm having a hard time, I'll just say, dude, are you available? It's just a chat. It doesn't have to be scheduled. Like, like can, we, can, we need to to this? can I just share a yeah. few things with you your thoughts? Someone you must have built some sort of relationship with is Dan Sullivan to have written three books with him. What's the genesis of that relationship? How did that whole thing start? The genesis was 2014 in the fall. That, so basically, call it August, September, October, November. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. The fall of 2014 was my first semester as a PhD student. So I'm living in Clemson, South Carolina. I'm a first year PhD student, first semester PhD student. And that's the time. So first off, my master's thesis research was on entrepreneurial courage. So like I was deeply studying courage. I was working with one of the top researchers in the world on courage. I was also studying entrepreneurship on the side. And when I first got into my PhD program, I was really... Like I said, I was opening up and finally, like I just achieved one big keystone goal, just gotten into that spot. And so I was opening myself up to my next future self. And it was th at that point that I felt I could finally start giving myself the space to really 
pursue the future self like as a writer career um and my aunt jane joined genius network and she started to become really exposed to dan sullivan's work i had no clue who that guy was i was very aware of most self-development and business so like tim ferris and stuff like that i was very in the know on that stuff but dan sullivan truly actually back then and even still is quite a niche character back then for sure a niche character i mean these books have popularized him quite a bit um but even still he's not a tim ferris no in terms of popularity right i get you yep but my aunt jane would start to send me these little dan sullivan quote books and so i would just start reading those and i just fell in love with them and you know i'd listen to dan interviews and stuff like that and i just thought he was brilliant and i started to kind of get more acquainted with that community genius network specifically and i was a first year phd student i was making twelve thousand bucks a year as a graduate research assistant i had no business i had no website i'd never written a blog and so i was not an entrepreneur but i was interested in it i was i'd been studying self-development for quite a few years uh i knew i wanted to be a writer didn't know i wanted to be an entrepreneur but i was trending in that direction and was loving his writing and ultimately just decided that not then and there, but I decided like I wanted to get into Genius Network and be in the same group with my aunt because I saw that a lot of the people I did like, the Tim Ferriss and stuff had been through that community in some form or fashion. And and so, you know, fast forward a few years, I've blogged a lot, you know, gotten that book deal, was writing Willpower Doesn't Work. And I, I actually took the money from my first book deal, Willpower Doesn't Work, which um, was the first real money I ever made. And I actually just took it to join that group. Paid the 25,000 bucks, joined the group. We still have, were poor as heck, you know, like don't have any money really, but took the money I made and joined that group and quickly joined the higher tier up group and ultimately got into the group with Dan. It was Joe's 100K group. And, you know, that was near the end of 2017 when I first joined that group. So, you know, we're fast forwarding like two and a half years. Like, and those are the years that I'm writing on medium.com. That growing a massive email list, I get a book deal. I start writing Willpower Doesn't Work. I'm writing Willpower Doesn't Work through 2017. Join Joe's group. Go near the end of 2017. 2018 comes around. That's when Willpower Doesn't Work comes out. We adopt our kids, all sorts of crazy stuff. But I'm in the higher tier group, and I'm starting to get to know Dan. You know, and he starts, you know, he knows me. I've spoken at the group. I was a huge blogger at the time. I was kind of known as a massive blogger. Plus, Willpower Doesn't Work came out, and they all liked it. They all kind of promoted the book. and you know, I wasn't super close to them, but like I was in their group. It was not a big group, like a group of like 20. Anyways, there was just one session where, and I talk about this in the book, Who Not How, but there was just one session where he was teaching about Who Not How. He just kind of showed the model and it was like his first time really teaching it. And I just told him, I just said, Dan, if you ever want that to be a major book, I freaking love that idea. Like I would write that book. And uh, that's kind of what Genesis, the relationship, it took a, like over a year to get the book deal because my publisher didn't know who Dan was. You know, I was with a major publisher. I was with the publisher that Ryan Holiday's with, Seth Godin's with, Simon Sinek's with, like Portfolio Penguin. I was with them. Hmm. Um, you know, like if you read any books and you see this symbol, yeah. that is Portfolio. Like this is like the top of class business book. That was where I was writing my book, First Eyes and Permanent. They had no idea who Dan Sullivan was, didn't want anything to do with him. And so like, I was like screwed. I was like, well, I want to write this book with this guy, but my publisher doesn't know who he is, doesn't want to do anything with this guy. So it took about a year to get the book deal with Hay House. Ultimately, I transitioned over to Hay House, and you know, we wrote the book, and that's kind of how it all started. And you know, who, who not how was a lot more successful than people expected, and so led to more books. The cool part about that collaboration was, is like the idea of who not how that Dan truly believes that idea, and so you know, I'm the one who chose to write that book. He wouldn't have chosen for me to write a book because he was not the writer of the book. And so I was like, I want to write Who Know How. And I chose to write The Gap in the Gain and 10X is Easier Than 2X. To me, those were the ideas of his that I felt were useful, compelling, interesting, marketable ideas, ideas that I would want to write about. So he never, ever once off, you know, suggested an idea. Well, I won't say he never suggested <laughs> ideas for me to write about, but like ultimately, I, I'm the one who decided the book. Were there other concepts that you considered or were these the only three that even jumped up as possibilities for books? There were others that I considered. So like these I knew would be the first three and we were, we were actually planning a much longer collaboration. Obviously at this point, like 
I think it's becoming more known. Like 10X is easier than 2X is my last book with Dan. We've ended the collaboration. I'm not even interested to be a coach anymore, not because of any uh, negative energy or feelings, but um, I was very open to doing a second trilogy. But the book, the contract between me and Dan would have had to be different. So like when I set up the deal, I was still a graduate student. You know, my first book had just come out. I was not fully established. And so like for me, the business deal between Dan and I wasn't necessarily phenomenal. I mean, it was, it was 10x from where I was when we set it up. But you fast forward four years and, you know, I, you know we crank out Who Not How. It's a phenomenally successful book. We, you know, Gap and Gain, Successful, Future Self, and now 10x. And, you know, all of a sudden I go from a writer who's sold tens of thousands of copies to now almost a million copies. And these books have also generated tens of millions of revenue for Strategic Coach. Um, very non-secret that these books drive hundreds of people, you know, even at this point, probably not, not thousands, but probably uh, over a thousand people have joined Strategic Coach directly from these books. It just stopped making sense for me to get zero form of the back end, which was how the deal was. Like I just, I, I got the money for the books. Um, they got the money for Strategic Coach. And if anyone who's in the business of books knows, you really don't make that much money from books. It's really about the back end. And yeah. so like, I I was just, I wanted to do a second trilogy, but we would have to renegotiate how I got paid. And it just didn't make sense. Was there, um, from their from was, their perspective what, yeah i was gonna say what was the resistance just um hey look we just see it as two separate things you energy for the book money for the book and you know the proceeds that come i'm just i think that it, share, I, yeah. I, well i mean a lot of that's their their perspective and so i don't yeah. want to overly provide um i know that they've gone through many experience like dan's an enormously good promoter of other people like if you think about people, people like peter diamandis and stuff he's really grown uh, abundance 360 and does so many things and so Dan, you know, he's had his own experiences that have led him to wanting collaborations to be your money is your money, my money is my money. You know, and he, uh, admittedly, they were very generous that like we didn't split deals, which would be typical for co authorship. Like they gave me all the money. But again, um, the book money is not very much money. Like Who Not How was a $250,000 deal. Just giving logistics, like Tucker Max got 25% of that just because he was kind of the agent on it. Uh, I ended up investing more than that in just the marketing of it. And so like, even though very generous to give me all the money for the book, in the end, it was not very much money. But I think that there was a lot of a lot of reasons um, why, why I came to the end. I will say one of the books that I would have absolutely done, it would have been book number four, would have been Always Be the Buyer. So like I, I was thinking that the, the uh, Always Be the Buyer is one of my favorite Dan ideas. Um, and I think it has huge potential. But Basically, I saw that there was kind of like a Who Not How trilogy, or even you could call it the NX trilogy. And then there was going to be what would be called a Free Zone trilogy. Free Zone is really Dan's highest level program all about entrepreneurial collaborations. And so um, that would have been kind of the next higher level trilogy. The first book would have been a concept called Always Be the Buyer, which is a really cool idea. It's kind of contradictory, you know, a fear, either being a buyer or a seller. If you're a seller, you're always trying to sell yourself. Whereas if you're the buyer, you can walk away not desperate you know who you are you know who one and interestingly i just i couldn't write that book and stay in the collaboration the way it was because i was being the seller what i mean by that is is like i couldn't write that book because i wasn't being the buyer like the buyer the buyer has to get what they want or walk away and powerful relationships happen when all parties get what they want but when one person's not getting what they want but they're staying in the relationship because they think they need it or because they're desperate then they're being the seller and so it just stopped making sense. And admittedly, I did many things wrong too. Like uh, even just in bringing up the conversations to change the negotiations, it was a highly emotional thing for me to bring that up. And so I, I approached it improperly, you know? And so a lot of maybe why it didn't work out was truly my, my own immaturity on on approaching it. But in the end, I, it's, it's, it's the right place to be. I mean, I the three books are awesome. Yeah. I could have I could have seen doing three more books, um, but I'm very uh, I'm very happy with what we did, and I think it's I learned a lot. Um, that's part of I think the gain mindset, and I think uh, yeah, it's going to open me up to really fun collaborations in the future that will be set up differently, uh, which I think will make them even bigger and better. So it's, it's all gains. It's all gains and gratitude. It's very interesting. 
Yeah, well, you actually just answered a question I was going to ask, but I'll, I'll phrase it this way just to make it clear, uh, just so like I'm clear, I guess. The question was going to be, which statement is true? That if I knew what I knew then, I would have never gotten into a collaboration. Or I'm so glad I did this collaboration because it built me to a point where now I've got leverage in the next collaboration. I think it's the latter. I right, listen up. This is Jamie. And I want to know if you're ready, if you're ready to take control of your life and reach your full potential. Think about that. Full potential, not maybe I can, but full potential. GoBundance has offered me and offers all of you the systems, tools, collaboration, mentorship, training, accountability, and community that you need to boost your success. With GoBundance membership, you're going to get access to the GoBundance training portal, member masterminds, the GoBundance toolkit, live interactive webinars, trips, private Facebook group access, which is super, super active. Wait till you check out the, the Facebook group. And GoBundance GoPods. My GoPod and I are insanely close. Take your life and business to the next level with GoBundance. Go to GoBundance.com today. Apply for membership. Trust me on this. Have the conversation with me or one of our other ambassadors, and we'll make sure that you're clear on the value proposition for you. Look, you feel like right now, if I invest my money, I don't know what the return is going to be. That's why you're holding it. Better to invest in the one asset that has returned you over and over again, the maximum return, and that's investing in you and the community around you. GoBundance.com. Make sure you apply today. Enjoy the rest of the show. When people say the phrase, if I knew what I know now, would I do it the same way again? And a lot of people say, of course, because then I would I wouldn't know what I know now. But what I'm saying is, is if I knew what I know now, on a lot of things, I'd do things differently because my past self didn't know what they were doing. And so if my past self knew what I know, they would absolutely do things differently. Um, <laughs> not that I have any forms of regret, but like, that's what wisdom is, you know? And so it's like, yeah, if I knew what I know now, I don't know if I'd write those books with Dan. And that's nothing against Dan. That's just, I would have a different vantage point, a different knowledge, which would lead me to different strategic decisions. It's fair. Um, I have no regret in the path I took. I don't think it's useful to regret the past. I don't think it's useful to have negative energy or emotions towards other people as well. Um, instead, just learn from experiences, learn from the past, learn from life and be better, not bitter. I got a lot out of it. I learned a lot. I know that it made me a better thinker, a better writer. It exposed me to a lot of things, a lot of people. It's interesting. There's like, so I have my own books. I have my solo books. Yep. And those, so, it, it, one thing that I have learned recently, and I will share this with you, I think it's very interesting, is, is that different messages truly do resonate with different people and with different potential situations. And I guess I didn't fully appreciate this because if I look at the outcomes of my personal books, they have brought about opportunities that are far more intrinsically interesting to me and surprising you know like someone who's a leader for example uh in my church read personalities and permanent and just random connected with me and wanted me to get involved in supporting the missionaries in that church and so what i take from that is is that something in the messaging of that book resonated with that person which led to that type of opportunity hmm. which that type of opportunity would not have come from the gap in the game you know what i mean i do so, even though i'm happy with the opportunities that the dan books present to me they're very different from the opportunities that my own books present to me even future self you know right now i'm in conversation with russell brunson about making future self coaching programs and i think it's really interesting um, but it could be anyone else. All I'm saying is, is I've always, you know, at least for the last five years, really believed in the future self concept. I think it's really cool. And it's interesting what kind of um, opportunities, I guess you could say, that book, again, that message is leading to, which is, again, very different from the opportunities that the Dan books lead to for me. And, and they're both very beneficial and not contradictory. But it's just very interesting and I just say this for anyone who's creating a message or creating a brand or creating a business that the nuance of what you put out in the world is going to come back to you in 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 opportunities or in in situations and to be very thoughtful about what you put out because it not only impacts people obviously what you put out there but it also attracts things to you 
And if you're, and I guess you can know if you're putting out the right things based on what you're attracting back to you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was just kind of pondering that very deeply recently that two of the very more personally meaningful opportunities that have presented themselves to me have come from my own books, not from the Dan books. And, you know, the Dan books have been a little bit more successful, not because of Dan's marketing, honestly, or even because of his name. It's kind of like people are a lot more accountable to other people than they are to themselves. I put way more into the Dan books than I put into my own and into the marketing just because like, I, I can't not do that. You know, it's like, you'll, you'll, you'll go to the gym if you got someone waiting for you, you know, but it's on your own. And so like, I put way more soul, not soul, but I put way more work into sure. making sure that those books succeeded than even my own. That's interesting. You did the 10 X marketing was insane. I thought it was brilliant. Honestly, all of what you did, the package of books in exchange for a course, you know, you, it amounted to like less than a grand to have a six week uh, challenge course intensive. And in exchange for that, you're selling 50 books at a clip. You know what I mean? That's brilliant, brilliant marketing. That's sold you know? so, like, that's sold like 20,000 copies right there. No kidding. Just that. Just that. Unbelievable. So Just no, that I challenge see that. was 20,000 hardcovers too. And hardcovers yeah. are not easy. But to your point, like I think a personality is impermanent. And uh, the, even the first part of that book, you really, you really went deep on some of these assessments, right? Like DISC and that sort of thing. And it was a really neat perspective. And then you introduced characters, one of which I actually met as a result, Andre Norman. I, I don't see characters sure. like he's, he's a real person. <laughs> but a guy yeah, that yeah. goes well, from- He is a character. He is a character in the he book. He is a character too. But he goes from a top five prisoner in like the federal or state system in Massachusetts to a Harvard graduate or a Harvard fellow or, or whatever. I mean- you talk about the idea that personality has a spectrum, right? You can, you can be something different. You're not what you were. Um, I had a guy on this podcast. Do you remember the fire festival thing? Did you ever see that on Netflix? No. So Billy McFarland is his name. Uh, he essentially puts on this huge festival. He partners with Ja Rule, if you remember with ja, ja Rule, in the Bahamas. And then, like, you know, it's not like the festival wasn't real. It was supposed to be real, but I, he just he put a, a really tight timeline on an Island that needed like infrastructure to bring a thousand people in. Everyone gets there. There's no lights, no plumbing. There's like only tents, like FEMA tents, absolute mess. He, he ends up going to jail for four years for fraud. And he was, he was commingling funds and all this stuff. He just got out a year ago and he's trying to relaunch the same festival. I had him on and the amount of people coming out like, ah, once a whatever, always a whatever, a fraud, a cheat, a, you know, and, and honestly, no That's bullshit. Like once I had an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, man. Right. I had your book in my mind. It's like personality isn't permanent, even just the title, not like thinking of every chapter or anything. And it does. It's like, I don't know. Maybe he is. He could be. He still could be a fraud. I don't know. But I'm certainly not going to just say because he was, he is. And to your point. That's what your book is all about. You know, that that book resonated for me. It is different than they're all good, but different than the series with Dan, the who, not how gap gain 10 X is used in two. That series is a lot more. I mean, there's a lot of psychology in there. Um, yeah. In the Dan books. But yeah. They're a lot more targeted towards a successful entrepreneur looking to become more successful, which is cool. I mean, I, I'm all for that. It's just a different audience, a different spirit, which is not a bad spirit. And I'm happy I wrote those books. One thing I will just quickly say is, is that, from my standpoint, personality is, is you've heard maybe the term lagging indicator before, yeah. but like personality is a lagging indicator of your identity. And so That's like, yeah, so personality is the surface identity is, is kind of the in, internal personality is external and personality is kind of one of those things that like is there's no use in even working on it. I mean, you can, if you want, you're far more used in working on your identity um, like identity is something you can define, something you can craft, cultivate, and it's ultimately the driver of your actions and behaviors. And so, um, identity is a 10 times more powerful concept. And I actually even was trying to make that point with the book. I, I, it, hilarious. I mean, I agree that people's personalities change over time. The research is huge on that. You know, if you were to genuinely measure me fully in how I operate, how I make decisions, how I react and respond, like fully tested me if you could ever do that, which you can't, and measure me against who I was a year ago, you'll probably find a non-correlation, truly, in the person I am and the person I was. There's a non-correlation. And even though there's still going to be a lot of crossover, I'm not saying I'm the uh, fundamentally different person, but I'm different enough that we would not be correlated. Is personality, you're making me think of this question. I, I hope it makes sense. 
is personality as a lagging indicator. I like that a lot. You've said identity, you take action, personality sort of lags or what your personality is lags. Is it, is it uh, ascribed by you or is it ascribed by the way in which you're perceived by others? So with the tests, it's essentially ascribed by you because with the tests, you're the one filling out. It's self-reported which is actually one of the reasons why I think personality tests are dumb is because if you're self-reporting something, you're describing yourself, which to me means you're describing your identity. You're describing how you see yourself. Wow. Personality more accurately probably should be measured by other people. I mean, it's more of an external, it's how you respond to the outside world and stuff like that. I think that a more accurate this is not actually how it's done. This is just me spitballing. I think yeah. a more accurate measure of personality would be done 360 by other people, even though no one knows you the way you do, you know, but it's usually never tested that way. Usually it's tested by the person just answering a survey, describing themselves. Can you define personality? Oh my goodness. Um, I mean, there's a, test, a lot of way. <laughs> I know. I, I, test I, I, but I'm just trying I to, probably, like, yeah, yeah. I probably should know since I wrote a book on it. Um, <laughs> no, your definition, like define it. Because yeah. identity, personality, again, they're terms that I think are, are often thought of as interchangeable. So can you mm, just the nuance? They are the definitely the different. They are totally not interchangeable. So help me with that. Yeah, yeah okay. So first off, identity, it, I, I'll start with identity and then I'll go to personality. So identity is a few crucial things. First off, it is in a lot of ways, the narrative with which you have for yourself. So the narrative, there's a whole theory on this called narrative identity. And so it's the story that you use to describe yourself. You could use it to describe your past self, your present self, and your future self. But it's your story. It's your narrative of yourself. You could also look at it as your image. So it's like, it's it's the picture you have of yourself in your mind, right? So like, that's your identity. That's at least a part, a big part of it. Yeah. Uh, so if you were to have a picture of, you know, Jamie in your mind, that self-image in large part is your identity. So it's in a lot of ways, it's a picture and a story. <laughs> but another crucial point of it is, is your identity is also your standards. And, and this is the kind of side of it that I hit really hard and 10x is easier than 2x. But your standards largely are your ceiling and your floor. And I actually make the emphasis that it's actually your minimum standard, your floor, because that's what you're absolutely most committed to. Your floor is what you're ultimately committed to. If you were committed to something higher, then that floor wouldn't exist. <laughs> True. And so one of the core definitions of identity is, is it's, it's, the, uh, it's the things to which you're most committed to as a person. I think about standards and story with, with, with identity. The standards are those things to which you are, you are firmly committed as a person. So that, that's kind of the crucial core. And, and your story and your standards are going to ultimately drive your behavior. And the personality, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of looking at personality. One would be persona, which is where the word came from. And persona is like a mask that you put on. Like a persona, the, the, if you actually look up the word persona on YouTube, you're going to see it, it has a lot to do with the roles you play. You know, because it's like if, I'm, if I'm playing a character in a story, right, like I'm going to put on, a, I might put on a mask if I'm going to play, right? But so they say that the persona is like the mask you wear. Um, I sort of see it that way, but and may, maybe maybe there you know there's a lot to that. Um, one definition of personality that I've seen is it's kind of your consistent way of reacting to situations. So, as mm -hmm. an example, if you're in a social situation, what's your consistent way of reacting to that situation? Is it to go and talk to people, or is it to go shy away? You know, and that'd be introversion versus extroversion, right? Um, you know, when you're in a stressful situation, what's your consistent way of acting? Is it to, you know, be emotionally impulsive or to, you know, to be thoughtful and stuff like that? That would be, you know, your emotional side, the emotional development. They call that like neuroticism. If you've got low, neuro, you know, high neuroticism, then you're very like emotionally unstable, right? And so, yeah, I think that one of the simple ways that people define it is just it's your consistent way of reacting. Gotcha. Okay. That helps a lot. I appreciate you deep, deep diving that. I know it wasn't quite. I don't know if that really but helps the people. It does. In my it opinion, does. in my opinion, personality is a non-useful topic. Uh, it's like 
yes, people change. And yes, even their reactions to situations change over time. Although, of course, there's some consistency. If you were to genuinely look at how a person is, is being in this situation versus how they're being in that situation, from situation to situation, they'll be different. And over time, they'll be different. If I was to watch you in a social situation today and then watch you at some random time five years ago, I might see a very similar Jamie, but I might see quite different Jamie, mm. depending on so many different factors. Yeah. When you're writing these books, the Dan Sullivan trilogy, and maybe we'll just center it down on 10x is easier than 2x. Are you, are you in practice on this and then write the book or does the book reveal for you? Because you know, part of the book is going back and looking at when you've 10x and everything else like that. I guess in the process of writing the book, is it like, okay, I've embedded this concept, I'm writing the book, or as you write the book, is the concept becoming more clear for you? Probably the latter. So like, just as one example, like there was no, like Dan actually made zero edits to 10x is easier than 2x. And so he did not tell me what to put in it. And they actually told me not to. What, I, I was never told what to put into any of these books. For me, and this is actually one of the challenges that I have with writing a book, is, is that it is very experiential. So like, I'm not going to write about something without gaining a, a deep dive immersion into it. Otherwise, I really have a hard time cons um, making it practical or useful or, or, or deep diving around it. And so usually for the first several months that I'm writing a book, I'm, I'm doing a lot of broad study and, and then ultimately shaping down the thinking and seeing where I agree agree with it, disagree with it, where I've applied it, where I haven't applied it, where I understand it, where I don't understand it, where I want to apply it um, to better understand it. Because um, I won't write it unless I'm really convicted about it. And so part of the conviction is applying it on much higher levels. And so even as an example, while writing that book, I did broach the subject of the collaboration with Dan and Babs because I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could write the book with the conviction I wanted while I felt like we were in a very 2x relationship. And so like, I, I, I didn't want to just, I had to have the conviction and courage and the willingness to let go of it if it became part of my 80% using the language of the book. Um, and so I applied it at extreme levels to extreme risk in my life while writing it to test it, to feel it. Good transformational teaching and writing can't just be conceptual. It also has to be deeply emotional. And, and in order for it to be deeply emotional, uh, it has to have been a written from an emotional place and so for me i couldn't get to the place of writing what i wanted to say or even knowing what to say until i started fully applying it and dealing with the realities of it to the extent i could understand i made a lot of changes in my life while writing that book any that stand out one change that stands out from writing this book i mean i'll share several one was ending the collaboration with yeah. and Babs, which yeah. collaboration was long over before the book came out yeah I mean, yeah. and so like that was part of figuring out what was 10x and obviously a core premise of the whole idea is you let the 10x future filter the present whereas 2x is letting the present shape the strategy for the future when you're going 10x the future is what drives the present and so uh i bought a new house that was you know so i have as an author like i actually have a second house i have and i've had that for years but the house that I had, which I wrote multiple books in, is like 15 minutes away. And I just didn't really like where it was at. And so like I actually wanted to remove that friction. And so I actually just got a second house in my neighborhood, like where we live. Um, so like that was just one thing, removed the friction. Um, and that's that was, again, 10x moves are, are personal and individual. There's one other really big 10x move that I made uh, recently as a result of writing. It, it, like, and it was it was hit me while I was writing the book. And that was basically just to keep it simple. I'll tell the story of Kimberly Clark, which is from good to great. And then I'll use that to explain how I am, what I applied to my business, which is intense. But basically the story in Kimberly Clark, and this is from good to great is, is this is a paper company. It's probably the most popular story in good to great. But basically in 1971, new CEO comes in. I think his name is Darwin Smith, Darwin Smith. But, Anyways, that company, Kimberly Clark, has been around since the 1800s. It's been around for a long time. It's a staple American company, paper company. They've got big paper mills. They make paper that's turned into notebooks, magazines. And ultimately, he decides that they should go all in on part of their business. It's only 5% of their revenue. But he believes that if they go all in on that, they can, go, they, like they can become the best in the world. And so ultimately, he ended up selling the 
the mills is what they say. And he sold those and got rid of 95% of their revenue and then went all in on, call it that little 5% and 10x that. Well, one of the things that ultimately I've done is I have a coaching business myself, though I've never scaled it. You know, I mean, it makes a couple seven figures, you know, it's like a two, two and a half, three million dollar, but it doesn't really challenge me. Very much. It's not challenge. It doesn't require much of me, but I also have like courses and stuff like that. And that stuff is outside of the 20% of my next 10 X. And so I ultimately decided to end all that. And I told all the people that were in the program, like 2023 is my last year. So like, these are not going to continue. And that is, you know, effectively 60 or 70% of my income that I'm just letting go of and don't necessarily have a next plan. Often people, before they strip away the 80%, they already know what their next 20% is. Yeah. But I actually stripped away the 80%, which was that, to create space to open myself up to the next 20%. Yeah, I mean, basically, I let go of 60 70% of my business um, and the collaboration with Dan. Those are two big things that I let go of in the process of writing 10x is easier than 2x obviously wow. so many other things i mean one other one other thing i will say when it comes to the 20 percent, which is how i wrote the book so like my standard for 10x is easier than 2x i felt like the standard needed to go much higher than the books i'd written previously and so like i got a different editor like i even talked about that in the book I hired a very top tier editor who i felt like would hold the book to a much higher standard than anyone else all the people at my publisher loved it. Dan and Bab loved it. And I was like, no, not even half what it could be. And so even just the writing of the book, I felt like I wanted to apply the thinking and make it qualitatively different and better than that. Interesting. Is that the abnormal move to not know you're 20 before? You said most people know they're 80. I shouldn't say abnormal. Is it sort of, it almost feels like, you know, uh, the practical or the reasonable would be before I strip away my 80, I'm clear on my 20, right? I'm clear on my 20. Now I know where I should be. So the rest of this should fall by the wayside. So is it, are you viewing this or is it maybe in your research almost like that, that 1% of 1% move to strip away what you inherently know to be the 80 to explore the 20? I think it's a higher principle to do it that way. I think most people well won't do it because the 80% is security. And so usually we don't strip away our security until we have our next security. Right. For most people, what they do is, is once they get their next opportunity and it's clear that it's better than the last one, you know, once they can go all in on the next thing, then they'll let that kind of weed out the other stuff. And I think that that's fine. But I think it's very powerful to create the space first, to strip away the 80%, not all of it, but as much, just some of it and actually create space to open yourself up for something that could be different and bigger and better. Because if you have a lot of 80%, which we all have, when I say 80%, that's just 80% of your life that's busy. That much noise, like you're just squeezing in insight rather than creating massive space for insight and openness. And so to strip things away and create that space and open yourself up without fully knowing What's going to come to you is, in my opinion, a higher, a, a much higher leap of faith. Are you, how far, in, I mean, you have the potential collaboration you mentioned with Russell Brunson. Is that an element of where you're starting to figure out your new 20? Or do you feel like, nah, I'm playing with it. I'm still not clear uh, on even the room in which I want to get in for the new 20. So how I look at it is, is that the goal shapes the process. One way of looking at it is, is that the goal shapes the bottleneck. And the bottleneck is the 20% that needs to be solved. And so the goal is going to shape the 20%. Um, it's not the 20% that shapes the goal. It's, it's the goal that shapes the 20%. Uh, so it's the goal that determines what you focus on and what you decide to go all in on. As part of creating massive space, it's helped me get more and more clear and connected to my next level future self and even to define what I was calling before a keystone goal, which is not any crazy. It's not like it's something massively outside the scope of what I could see and what I could think about a year ago. I've certainly gotten clear on my future self and on what matters and what I'm going to go all in on. And then that goal then opens up for me potential 20% strategies or relationships or collaboration or just projects, missions, as you would say. I'm still clarifying it, um, but, I'm, but I try not to overly clarify the path before I have a goal. 
Because sometimes a path won't get you where you want to go, even if it's a good path. True, true. The book itself, 10X is easier than 2X, and maybe you just articulated it. But after people read it and digest it, and you know, like we've had, I've had discussions with friends on it, right? We've kind of, kind, kind of gone deep and debriefed the book, if you will. What is, I don't know, one, two, three, maybe it's only one. If, if, if in a year or two years or five years, somebody came to you and said, you're the guy that wrote 10X is easier than 2X, this is what's happened in my life. What, what is it that you're looking to, what would be the ideal? What are you trying to create? What are you trying to uh, mobilize people? I know to 10X, obviously, but is there anything inherent in that or, or a part of that or an action step within that that you feel is sort of like within the book, there's this key concept that the people just get this, that book will have been successful. One thing I will say, and it's made me very proud and also humbled, is the the feedback I've gotten from certain types of people. So as an example, like I've trained in very high level situations where there's where people in the room are all generally have businesses oh you know, doing over a hundred million dollars a year, stuff like that. And been surprised as I teach some of the frameworks and models, some of them in the book some of them, the psychological principles that then informed the models that are in the book. So I teach various models from the book and other models, and but around this idea of 10x versus 2x, and seeing that people who say are running a company that's doing 100 million a year saying, this is exactly what we've done to get where we're at, and this is, but I didn't really have the framing for it, and now this is exactly, now I see how we can take this and go 10x wow. again. So let me just give one really super example and then I'll, I'll I'll share in five years what would be like a cool cool like what i would hope people would get out of it but just another more recent example because i've gotten quite a few of these types of feedbacks and even opportunities again opportunities for different things but it, it uh, so like my phd is in organizational psychology and so like i my 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 dissertation was literally on a theory called transformational leadership theory. And a lot of people with my degree end up becoming consultants for huge businesses, training the leadership, training the culture, stuff like that. So for me, one of the big things that I've always been interested in, not always, uh, that, that's been an interest of mine and even a goal of mine has been leadership training and development. Um, that's something that's very important and something I love. I consider you a leader. You're a massive leader, Jamie. Anyone who's listening to this and go abundance are leaders. Like we're literally talking to leaders here right now. And so this guy, uh, someone, you know, so I do a lot of leadership training, but this book has afforded me opportunities for types of leaders who are more on the exponential curve. And so as an example, like I'm going to be training the leadership team of, of a company um, that four years ago was doing 5 million a year in revenue. Now they're doing over a hundred million a year in revenue. So they've gone 20 X in the last four years. But the CEO of the company was very much like he's a deep student of my work. And he's like, this book is our strategy guide for how we're going to get to a billion a year. He's like, and I think we can do it in the next two, like the next two or three because they're on kind of the exponential Moore's law curve. And so I'm going out to train their leadership on these. And so like what intrigues me is so now to answer the question, just kind of with that a little bit of that context, there's a guy in my coaching program who has a company that's doing five million a year. And I know I'm talking very bluntly about entrepreneurs right now, but I will break it down and make it a little bit more general in a second. But his company is doing $5 million a year, and he's been doing it in a more, call it 2x way, more, more, more linear for like the past 10, 15 years. And it's been good, steady growth. But we were talking about going from 50, sorry, 5 to 50, and how if he actually applied the models and understanding he had that going from five to 50 would actually be a lot faster and easier than it was to get from zero to five. And so it would be really cool for me in five years for me to have that guy walk up to me and say, I'm doing, I'm doing 50 and it was a lot easier than it was to get to five. Um, on a really practical level, what do I want people to get out of this book? I think a lot of it has to do with what we've been talking about. I view your 10 X future self as the person you most want to be. We use the example of Michelangelo and the David in the book, that you strip away everything that's not the David, right? And for me, that David is your 10x future self. And the stripping away of everything that's not the David is stripping away the 80% of everything right now in your life that is not your 10x future self. 
you use the future self as the lens and as the filter for shaping out everything. And basically the model we use in the book is just that 80% of your life at least isn't going to, isn't going to be that David. That's going to be stuff that's not the David that you're stripping away. And, and so, I, I mean, I just hope that people simplify their lives. And, you know, one of the, one of the great quotes is all progress starts by telling the truth. And I think that 10 X is a truth filter, truthfulness about what you want and truthfulness about what's holding you back. And so uh, I just hope that people's lives are simpler, more honest, more streamlined, less weeds in the garden, uh, more simple, you know, back to the front end of our conversation. It's like that things are simpler and way more effective. I think uh, something that I, that's a, that's an, an incredible answer and something that I I've found, cause I've talked to a lot of people about the book recommended it. You know, I, I've loved the book. Honestly, I love your work. So always a promoter. But the con, not but, and the concept of 10X and 2X, there's like two types of brains, I find. There's mine, which is sort of the conceptual, and then there's more the practical or engineer brain. Those that are engineer brain that have read the book, and you say it in here very clearly, they can't get off of the equation part of 10X is 2X. So here's my example. You said a guy at 5 million wants to go to 50 million. That's literally 10X, right? And 2X would be 10 million if you're doing it mathematically. Where really, I think what you've made the point of, and tell me if I'm wrong, maybe I'm reading it wrong, is 10x is is maybe a buzz phrase or or, or a, a a synonym for exponential. 2x is a synonym for incremental. So that same example, the five million guy, seven million might be a 2x move, and maybe 10 or 15 million is a 10x move. It could be depending on the dynamics of that business and where their mind is, right? Like 50 million might sound like, yeah, that's I can I can do that because I can see the path there. But really, in order to be there 10x wise, it might just be getting them off of a one or $2 million leap off of five, which is a, multi, a few percentage points uh, uh, increase, and maybe 10 million or 15 million. 3x is the true 10x. Am I wrong on that? Well, you're not wrong. And uh, I think that it takes a lot more nuanced thinking to see it the way you're, you're, you're describing it. Because you know, maybe the business isn't 10 times bigger but maybe it's actually 10 times better, right? And maybe they're working with five, maybe maybe they're making, maybe they're 3X, maybe they're 3X more, more revenue, but maybe they also have 3X less clients. That'd be three times three, that'd be nine, right? But maybe the quality of service they provide is fundamentally different, right? And maybe the boss is 5X more, less stressed, right? And so when you multiply these things together, it's a qualitatively different experience. It's a fundamentally different experience. And so I agree with you that 10x and 2x, they don't have to be overly um, quantitative. Like you don't have to overly, you don't have to overly get like literal with it. Although you can, like you can if you want to, but sure. I see it less literally. And it's like, so for me, a 10x might not be that I'm literally selling 10 times more books. Like maybe it's that I'm writing the books that I truly want to write, which I am, but I'm just saying maybe it's that I stop writing books altogether. Maybe writing kids books would be a 10x for me sure. for me for where i'm at you know like i can't define what's 10x for you and you can't define 10x for me it's pretty much like time is relative 10x is relative what's 10x for you and what's 10x for me is gonna be different and so yeah i, I agree with that yeah well I, to your point you you point to 10x moves even in your own life being around family and if you're not willing or able to look at these 10x 2x concept as qualitative versus quantitative i don't know how you quantify 10x better relationship with your kids or a 10x 10 more dates a year, 10 extra dates. I, I don't know with your wife or your husband or whatever it might be. Um, I think that- here's an easy way to help people with it. So I, here's a way of showing people from my perspective. And there's a few examples of how 10 X is actually the transformation. It's the exponential transformation that now opens up massively different doors. Mm-hmm. So as an example, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly is a 10 X. Can you quantify that? Like it's got wings and stuff, but like, you know, that's a 10x. So like a child going from crawling to walking, that's a 10x. Right. But in like a business situation, going from a horse and buggy to a car, that's a transformation, but it's not a it's not 10 times more horses. Like we didn't literally 10x. That's a good but point. that like the car is now fundamentally different than the horse and the buggy, right? And the example that I use, which I think is a really cool one is, you know, and it's in the front of the book, which is the Steve Jobs example, which where he essentially changed music, right? Music was CDs back in the 90s. Like you had CDs 
And if you heard a song on the radio that you loved, you'd go to the store, you'd buy a CD, you had to buy the whole album, even though you only wanted one song. And now you're carrying around this big bag of CDs. And so the 10X that Steve Jobs did, which, you know, back to the idea of stripping away everything that's not the David, he stripped away all the stuff that didn't matter. No longer do you have to go to the store, or buy it online. No longer do you have to buy the full album. You just can buy one song. No longer do you have to have the whole bag. You can just put them all in your pocket, right? Stripped it all away. And so that 10X transformation for me was CDs to iPod. Mm. Like that was the 10X. But with that new 10X, there's now fundamentally different possibilities. Now you can scale it totally differently if you want to. It doesn't mean you have to be able to scale it differently. But the true 10X, which is a qualitative change, a change in quality, was going from CDs to iPod. That 10X is what you know ultimately opened up so much of what came to pass after that for Apple. So that's kind of one way of looking at it is, is that the current version of you is like the CD. The next 10X is the iPod. You know, so what is that transformation? And that is not something that you can purely just quantify as 10 times more. Often, actually, just thinking 10 times more is what I would describe as 2X thinking. Amazing. So, so just trying to just do 10 times more, having 10 times more clients or writing 10 times more books, yeah. that's very 2X thinking. Man, it's an honor to have you on. I truly mean that to, to get all of this information, just not only on, on the book and the concepts, but just your backstory. There's so many lessons to glean from it. Uh, what's the best way for folks to find the book or you? Where do you want to direct people? I'll tell them in a second, but I actually genuinely want to know this because I know you're a deep student. You're just also just a good dude. Everyone who's listening to this loves you. <laughs> I actually just genuinely want to know whether it's from the book itself or from this conversation, what actually has stood out to you? What has stood out to me? Yeah, genuinely. Uh, the conversation itself. So I took some notes over here on the side. Uh, clarity is a skill. Simplicity is a skill. The clarity is a skill piece jumped out at me. Um, the, the difference between identity and personality jumped out to me. I've never heard it said that way. Maybe it was in the book and I missed it, but that there is a, that personality is a lag and it's really how you're perceived more. The persona, like you said, the mask, all of yeah. that. That was big for me because that, that, that is something where it's almost like focus on the process and the outcome will, will, achieve, will be achieved. It's the same sort of idea applied to how you're perceived. And for some reason that, that made a connection for me as to where I'm trying to go from the book. The biggest thing, if I got from the book and, and, and I've been fortunate to have a one or two conversations with you is, I mean, the concept of easier than two X boils down to when you've got an incremental move, a two X move, there are many ways to achieve that. I don't know if this was in the book or if I, if, if I read it or you said it. Right, right. But no, the example that I'm about to cite, it, it might've been in the book where you said about like getting a 2% raise or a 3% raise at work. I could do that. And it resonated having had a job in the past where that always seemed crazy to me, 2%, whatever. But I could think of a million ways to do that, right? I can try to get a promotion. I could do this extra project. I can just tell my boss, like I can think of all these different ways and I'll, I'll end up trying to pick five, six, eight, ten 10 of them. And I'm like moving the checkers up the board just a little bit, all of them, you know, never getting to the other side to be kinged, if you will. Whereas 10 X is essentially saying, all right, well, you're telling me what's possible. 3% raise what's impossible, right? Like what is impossible? Like, oh, well, impossible would be 20%. Okay. Well then what if you aim at that? That's essentially what, then it's like, well, there's only one way to do that, that I could think of. And you may not even be able to think of it in that moment, but the pressure it put on me or puts on me. And even just literally today. So I'll share this and not to go. No, go too this, long, is, but this is probably super interesting to your people. It's interesting to me. I, it's, it's fascinating. I'm in two, two, I feel like I'm, I'm condensed down to two paths. <laughs> <laughs> I've done all these things. I have this real estate business that I'm in. I've got this podcast. I have the Emerge community, kind of like what you had with AMP. I have uh, my own personal brand and what I'm trying to do there around sort of this idea of transitioning from high paid W2 to entrepreneurship. So recently I'm looking at like, okay, I, I, I need to, and I, I, I kind of blend the Stephen Pressfield uh, book and your story with your son with tennis going pro, right? The idea of going pro. What does that mean as a podcaster? Because I, I've shared with you, like, I want this platform to be so valuable that presidential candidates request to be on it. That's my, that's my 10 X vision, right? Uh, Great Joe, thanks, Joe. Joe Rogan, Lex Friedman, Jamie Gruber. That's where Robert Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy wants to go uh, when they have to, or when you release a book, you're coming oh, top 10 podcasts. We want to get on. I'm one of them. So 
so in the context of that, I've got, I've got all this focus on podcasts. I want to go pro and I put this, this goal to, or this uh, plan together to go pro. First thing is, you know what? I've learned this from some different podcasters. YouTube is a great top of funnel. Listenership is way easier to grow. Not way easier, more reliable as far as growth. But when you go viral on YouTube, it prompts pop, pops in your listenership. In other words, most people listen to podcasts, gym, car, whatever. Some people watch. And if you get virality on YouTube, it can, it can fuel your listenership and they stay there, right? So you bring them in through YouTube. So I'm like, well, let me get great at YouTube. So this month, that's all I'm doing. I'm getting great at YouTube. Next month, I want to get better as an interviewer. I think I'm pretty good, but I want to get better. Jordan had a coach, right? Like, you know, everyone's got somebody to make the best even better. So whether I'm the best or not, I don't know, but I want to get better. Uh, and then kind of getting into branding uh, in, in three months. But this quarter, that's kind of my plan. But as I'm doing the work, I'm like, okay, I've got sort of this like, I'm this entrepreneur in midlife over here. And then I got this podcast thing over here. And I talked to three people today on the concept of 10X. This is no bullshit. This is all centered around, and be, not even because you're on today, but I said, hey, so if I've got the podcast and, and everyone knows I want this thing to grow, do I simultaneously grow kind of my personal brand around this idea of you left the country, you moved to the Dominican, you did all these things because you were able to uh, leverage community and get clarity and build confidence and a new identity and all of that stuff. And all of them were like, it's got to be all podcast. And they're right. They're right. It's got to be all podcasts. So my personal YouTube channel needs to be focused on the podcast. My personal Instagram social platforms need to be focused on the podcast. So what has it done in the longest winded way I could possibly tell you is it's, it's continually condensed down and made me go, maybe do two things. You said clarity is a skill. It's made me stick to that vision. I want to have a, a, a platform that attracts presidential candidates. And the only way to do that is not to be in two places. I've got to be in one. I've got to be an expert at interviewing, at marketing, at, at growing. At so that's what I would call your keystone goal. Yes. Your keystone goal is, is that the, this podcast or your po whatever the podcast is, the podcast is at that level, top 10, where presidential candidates want to be on it. That is the keystone goal. It's also the 10X transformation. Yep. And it's that one thing. And that's the filter. That's the thing. So we are kept from our goal, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to lesser goals, such as building your brand, et cetera. So that's, that's the standard. That's, that is actually yeah. the keystone goal. That's it. It's just that one thing. What's the one thing that if accomplished will help you accomplish yeah. everything else you want to be and do and have? It's that. Right. Right. hundred percent, hundred percent. So, but that's what this book has done. It's made it so clear and it's made it so, I've been so uncomfortable every time I'm, I'm not aligned with the lane of 10 X. In other words, like that one, there's only one way. There's only one way. If that's my keystone goal, there's only one way to achieve that. And whenever I diverge from it, I can feel, I don't sleep as well. I'm all over the place. My days are not productive because I'm, I'm diverting energy away from what I've told myself and believe, I truly believe in the possibility of that keystone goal. But I think, and I love it. And, and I think an important consideration when you see yourself diverting one way or another, is why are you diverting? And chances are you're diverting into some 80%, whatever we'll use that as, something that would be filtered out, obviously, by the goal. <laughs> and it's going to be some security seeking, some short-term emotional soothing, whether it's short-term dopamine in social media or short-term dopamine in business wins or whatever it is. It's some form of distraction that gives you near-term security and back to the idea it's essentially using uh pressfield language resistance right but it's 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 truly the 80 percent and you seeking security rather than committing to the freedom that you truly want well said i, I that's that, what it is that makes so, but, but sense. when you're catching yourself diverting you're saying yeah why am i doing this is it it's gonna be oh, some can, form of emotional security yeah, emotional I could, security i could tell you why so you talk about collaboration um this podcast is in collaboration with GoBundance, right we each own it i own half they own half so the security part is well i gotta have my if i don't have roots in something that's only mine for whatever reason even though this gives me <laughs> a ton of fulfillment a ton of success and there's there's benefits i get from it like you said within there might be a point there might be a point where i look at this and say not the right collaboration for me anymore you know, like I've learned more. I've Maybe. gotten more Unless out of you it. guys evolve together and you keep making or it that. to next together. Correct. If our Maybe. visions grow in conjunction. But the point is, I think I'm trying to latch on to, wait, 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 don't, you know, have your own thing. And a part of that is when I had a job, when it felt the most 
at the end, I'm making 400 grand a year. I've got this equity position. And when I felt the most trapped and the least uh, in control of my life was the realization that, oh my God, I'm fully reliant, or at least in part reliant, I'm collaborating with this large company for the last 20 years. Like that's, that's, that's not me. It's not my own thing. Right. So I've always felt like, well, I got to have my thing. And I, I do, but at some given, point, well, given what, given what you know now, which you learned a lot from that, continually set if if sticking with GoBundance is the path, continually shape it so that it so that you don't reach that conclusion in the future. You know, you continually right. shape the collaboration so that it keeps you getting what you want, or at some point you hit the ceiling and you know you'll go some separate way. But given that you have all that knowledge and experience. You know, and you turn it into a gain, <laughs> so you turn it into something you can use for the future. Use it, and I'm sure you already have, to to continuously set this thing up so that it doesn't become that. If this if this pathway is one that makes sense for your yeah. next ten x jump, that's a great point. No, that's a great point. I do have to continually leverage and use and and grow with, as opposed to allowing myself to become more embedded and feeling like then I'm trapped. Right. So it's like I've learned from digging the hole. Don't dig the hole here. Continue to evolve it. It's great advice. Great advice. Wow, man. Thank you. That was cathartic. <laughs> that was awesome, dude. You're awesome. Your people are awesome. Thanks for thank you for sharing what you got out of it because it was cool for me hearing back um, what you got out of it. Mostly the book stuff, but even just the stuff on like personality. It's really yeah. interesting when you hear someone communicate back to you what you were trying to convey and to hear their philosophy, their perspective. Sure. To see if it should even make any sense. <laughs> like and so your your what you described even on the personality side was very insightful. I'm like, okay, well, you got something out of that. Like I, I conveyed something. Um, but I also just I like I like that you're uh, you're grappling with this book and it seems like uh, it's forcing that clarity upon you, which is cool. Oh and you're, you're, and you're and you're and you're a big of well, I'll just quickly say a lot of the things that we strip away as part of that eighty percent are our identity and and a big part of identity which i didn't even write about in the book is what they call hidden commitments and that there might be some form of hidden commitment you know that came from some somewhat of the trauma of leaving that business that you got to do it on your own and it's just it's really powerful when part of the letting go of the 80 percent is letting go of ideas letting go of beliefs letting go of things that no longer fit with what makes with where you're at now in your knowledge and so wow. I can see that you're grappling with that as well. And that's part of why, why we let go of certain things. Yeah. It, we're now letting it go. It's a big concept and 10 X. It's not a little thing. So giving away something that you feel like, wow, but it's, but it's been good to me or whatever, but it's not, it's not aligned with where I'm going. So yeah. Grappling is a future. great word. Yeah. It's not, yeah. It's, when you let the future be the filter for the present, you got to grapple with some hard decisions. It's a mic drop. It's a mic drop. I love it. Now, now let's hear. Where should people go? Where should they learn more about you or the book? All right, all right. No, that was uh, great. I mean, if you haven't read 10X is easier than 2X, read it or get the audiobook. Uh, me and Dan obviously do three hours of additional interviews, uh, which we do stuff like that on Who Not How and the Gap of the Game as well. Um, check out Be Your Future Self Now audiobook or book you know just i mean honestly just check out those books uh, i do have a youtube channel uh so you can obviously watch content there and just benjaminhardy.com benjaminhardy.com is my website there's really not much there it's mostly just there if you want to book me for like a podcast or a leadership training so but it's there benjaminhardy.com so yeah i appreciate you man thanks for being on i uh, look forward to our next meeting and this is great thank you <laughs>